Shalom, shalom to everyone watching here on the Waves of Israel. And I want to welcome you this morning as we begin our continuation of Sefer Haikarim by Rabbi Albo. His comments and idea regarding the basic concepts of Judaism. So let's get started this morning. And we're going to get started with chapter, book three, uh, chapter five already. Wow. I'm really progressing. Okay. So we're on book three, chapter five, where we begin the words of Rabbi Albo in chapter five of book three. We spoke of, in, of intellectual conception as given perfection to the soul. When combined with practical activity, the intellectual conception does not mean that the understanding of the intellectual concepts but the intention to serve God as the purpose of doing the physical act. In other words, he must do whatever he does with the intention of pleasing God. It's not just only feeling, but actually with the intentions of pleasing God and not for his own pleasure or any other purpose. We can take this as an example concerning this from the other spheres. They have bodies and rational souls like man and attain their perfection by continuous motion in order to carry out the will of God, who commanded them to move in order to maintain the natural universe. The psalmist makes it this very clear when he speaks of the duty of the creatures to praise God for the kindness he has bestowed upon them. He begins with the soul of man. Blessed the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Then speaking of the stars and the constellation, he says, Bless the Lord, all ye hosts, ye ministers of him that do his pleasure. The meaning is that the whole, the whole sole purpose of their motion is to do God's will and nothing else but his will. And this is the most perfect service any creature can give to God. For even in reference to the separate intelligence, that the Bible makes it clear that, the, that the, in the moving of the spheres, their only purpose is to carry out God's decree, who commanded them to, to, to cause their, their motion and nothing else, as we have read. Bless the Lord, ye angels of his, ye mighty in strength, and fulfill his word, hearkening unto the voice of his word. He calls the angels, who are separate intelligence, mighty in strength because they move the spheres continuously with great force. Then he adds that in causing the motion that they have, no other purpose except to do God's bidding. The whole and who commanded them to cause these motions? Because they are the obedient to God's word, the greatest object they can achieve, and not only in order to receive reward for any of uh, any other purpose. I have seen, says Rabbi Yabo, an explanation given of an expression, hearkening unto the voice of his word, that they move the spheres in order that they may hear better the word of God, in order to attain a greater perfection than they otherwise would. For they think that in this way they will get more influence and reach higher degrees. But this is impossible. For the verse in question deals with the angels causing the motions and not uh, with the spheres. But the perfection of the angels is, is always in act two, there being no potentiality in them. And their perfection consists in continuous comprehension. And with all of this, the Bible explains that their perfection is not due to merely their conception of ideas, but to the acts of causing motion in the spheres together with the intention to, to obey God, who ordered them to move the spheres. In the same way, the perfection of the spheres and the stars is due to the motion which they undergo in order to do the will of God. As we have said, the philosophers are wrong when they say that the spheres move continuously because of the desire to acquire perfect understanding by the change of position, by making a potential position actual. This is surely erroneous. For according to this opinion, the emotion of the sphere would be foolish and insane, like a crazy person who turns around 
a pillar at all the same time, or all at the time, thinking to acquire perfection of changing places, facing now the east, now the west, now the so north, or the south, and by making the potential places actual. This is clearly absurd, for since they, they admit that the spheres are rational animals having intelligent souls, how can they move in this way? The true explanation is as we have written, the purpose of the intention of the separate intelligence is causing the spheres to move and the purpose of the spheres in moving and none other than to do the will of God and carry out his commandment or his command that they should move. This is this is their only desire and perfection and nothing else. Now this may illust be illustrated as supposing the case of a person who, had, who was fond of a certain king. And on coming to visit him, he was accepted in the king's service. It's clear that the greatest happiness and the glory are to be acceptable servants to the king, and that he does, does his work with great enthusiasm and for no other purpose than to do the will of the king. This is also the consensus of opinions of uh, genuine ancient philosophers, as in Ibn Rashid, who says in the third question, <clears throat> who says in the third question of the destruction of destructionists, the language is as follows. The opinion of the ancients is that there are immaterial beings or principles which move the heavenly bodies and later move from the loyalty and the love and obedience in order to, by means of motion, to carry out the command of the former and to acquire understanding um, understanding of them by the heavenly bodies were created for the sake of their motion. Now since it's accepted that the principles which causes the heavenly bodies to move are free uh, from matter and are not bodies, they are uh, other ways in which they can move heavenly bodies except in the sense that the moving of the body is commanded to move. Hence they infer that the heavenly bodies are rational beings who understand themselves and understand the principles which, which moves them by the way of command. The men of the great assembly or the great synagogue also agree that the motion of the spheres is in order to do the will of God. We can see that it, this in the morning blessings or the blessings of the moon, which reads, Who by his word created the heavens, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. They are glad and rejoice and do the will of their maker. All of this shows that a corporeal act done with intelligent purpose do the will of their maker. All this shows it that this intelligent purpose to carry out the will and command of God gives perfection to those beings who have been intellectual souls. This also is proved by the prophetic promise of reward to those who honor the Shabbat. If you turn away from thy foot because of Shabbat and call Shabbat a delight, then thou delight thyself in the Lord. The rabbis also expatiate upon the great reward which comes to him who has pleasure on Shabbat and holidays. Though pleasure is a corporal matter in the physical act which man enjoys as a member of the genus animal and not by virtue by being human in species, if the pleasures were something enjoyed without any purpose, it would no doubt be the act of the animal. But if it's indulged with the purpose of serving God and obeying his commandment, it is without doubt an intellectual act like the motion of spheres, and it is this kind of act only that the purpose is attained, as we have said. Thus the rabbis say, in compared to the case of two persons who roasted their, their paschal lambs, the one ate it in the name of the paschal lamb, while the other ate it merely to gratify his appetite. To the first we apply the biblical text, for the ways of the Lord's are right, and the just do walk in them. To the second applies the sequel, but the transgressors do stumble therein, and is properly so. For in this way the human perfection may attain by the whole species, or greater part thereof, though he has knowledge and stands higher than he has who has no knowledge. But if the attainment of human perfection depended upon intellectual conception alone, well, it would be impossible of attainment by the whole species or the greater part thereof. 
There is an allusion to this also in the book of Ecclesiastes where Solomon inquires into the purpose of man. And I applied my heart to know wisdom. Come now, and I will tell, try thee with thy mirth. And I searched in my heart now to pamper my flesh with wine till I might see which is, was the best for the sons of men that they should do unto the heavens few, few days of their life. The question is mine is whether the purpose is conception of ideas or great wealth or high honor or corporeal pleasure. Then at the end, after he had considered each one separately, he discussed the reasons, pro and cons, and he sums up. The end of the matter, all having been heard, fear God and keep his commandment, for this is the whole of man. The meaning is we have, we have heard all of the arguments, considered all of the prophets of great wealth or great wisdom or other goods, and found that there is no good among them which embrace the whole race or the greater part thereof, except doing God's commandment, from the fear of God. Therefore, fear of God and keep his commandment, for this is good. It's superior to all the other goods, for this is the whole of man. The perfection embraces the entire human race, and therefore it stands to reason that of all perfection, this is true. This is the true one. This is true way of attaining perfection. It also proved that the passage of, in which God is represented is finding fault with those who thinks that the profession which they possess is the real one and pointing out that none of them is possessed of human perfection unless he does the right thing with a right proper motive. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Praise is due only with a view to the purpose. A horse is praised as a faster, as a fast runner because the purpose of the horse is used in running. And if we praise his color or form, it is because they are in the indications of, of his speed as a manner, which is the purpose, which is the purpose. Similarly, a physician is praised for his knowledge of medicine, not for his knowledge of geometry or astronomy. This is the reason why the prophet names here three types of excellence which one might suppose determines human perfection, etc., wisdom, strength, wealth. And he says that the wise man must not insist on wisdom, thinking that this way he has attained human perfection. Nor should the strong man boast of his strength, nor the rich man of his, his riches, for a thing is praiseworthy only if it leads to that purpose. Whereas no man can attain human purpose with, with any of these unless he associates conduct with every one of them. Unless he benefits others with this excellence which he has, this is the meaning of the text. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither the man, mighty man in his glory and his might. Let him not let not the rich man glory in his riches. He has no reason to boast. If for wisdom is confused to himself, and similarly wealth and strength, but only that it bestows the benefit thereupon upon others, and that too, not so with hope of reward, but in order that the others may have the benefits. As God does, he does bestow good things in this manner. In the meaning of the prophet's words, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord who exercises mercy, justice, righteousness in the earth, that he should understand and know that since I do mercy by reason of my wisdom, justice because of my power, righteousness by my reason of my riches, though I am not obliged to do so, it shows the things that are agreeable to me and that you should endeavor to do the things which I desire, and I shall understand that in these things I delight, says the Lord. Man must have this end in view, namely, to do the will of God and nothing else. He must act, not act with the expectation of reward, for God does good and shows mercy to others without expectation of reward. But because he acts, because the acts of his kindness are of kind 
are acceptable to him. Though the function of wisdom is primarily self-perfection, <coughs> nevertheless, <coughs> nevertheless, it's, it's proper as a matter of mercy to, to the wise man, mercy, that the wise man should benefit others, uh, to others with his wisdom. This is why the prophet associates benefits coming from the wise man and mercy, with mercy. Similarly, though strength is given to the strong, primarily to oppose an enemy and protect himself, still superior strength, with which a person is not intended to solely for self-protection, but in order to help others and save others from violence. Therefore, the protection of others which proceeds from that of a strong man is given this name of justice. Finally, riches, which are given to a man primarily to supply his own wants and secondarily to do good to others, are intermediate between mercy and justice and are therefore called righteous. In short, the idea of the prophet is that the acts which a person does, whether they be acts of mercy or justice or righteousness, must be done because they are acts which God desires to be done. Hence, the prophet ends up by this advice with his words. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. From this is clear that God desires certain acts when accompanied with intention of doing that which God desires, as it said, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord who execute mercy. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. Knowledge alone without the act is not sufficient. It is called knowledge when it's accompanied by the act and not before. Prophet Jeremiah says, Did not thy father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? He judged and he judged the cause of the poor and the needy when it was well. Is not this to, to know me? Thus the Lord says, thus he says expressively, that there is no virtue in the power of a king except when he does justice. And thus, this is the knowing what means knowing God. It's clear that these is no it is clear that there is no end more noble to enable man to attain human perfection than to know God. An act done in this manner describes is called the knowledge to indicate that the, that by so doing he acts in this manner, namely in the intention of pleasing God, and does not and does man attain his purpose mainly namely immortality of the soul and the world to come. Similarly, we find that the angel, in the, in the name of God, promises Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, immortality of the soul in the future world as reward for keeping the commandments and acting with the intention of serving God. And thus, and thus, thus says the Lord, Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, if will also judge my house and will also keep my courts. Then I will give thee free access among these that stand by. Jonathan ben Uziel translate the last phrase, among these seraphims. We see therefore that he promises his immortality of the soul and access to the angels who stand continually before God as a reward for judging his house and keeping his courts. That is, or this is what we desire to make very clear. Not only what's in the heart, but also within the mind, but also within the actions in which one commits themselves to do. To do what is right, right means to do that which God wants you to do in his time, and thereby we desire to fulfill his commandment, his will, his way. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero. Thank you for being with me. And may God bless you and yours. And remember, be part of the Ways of Israel. Join us every morning about this same time. And be part of the Ways of Israel. You can easily subscribe to our channel, Ways of Israel. Become a member. Download the membership file. And be part of the Ways of Israel. Contribute today, whatever you can. And thank you for being with us. Shalom, shalom.